is where we are going. And I'll start letting people through. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hello. Can I get a wave or a thumbs up just to make sure that the audio is working? That is great. Thank you. Um, I have everyone muted on entry, but if, if you just want to double check that you're um, muted, just in case there's any extra background noise. That would be fantastic. Thank you. We're just gonna wait another minute or two to let some more people through. And then we'll get going. Okay, I think we can uh, let me just double check one more thing. I think we could just get started. Um, good evening, everybody. Welcome um, to our lecture series. My name is Renee Westmacott, and um, I am your host for the evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight's lecture is the fourth in Ellen's six-part lecture series. Um, the subject tonight is the protective pelvis, pelvis, how trauma affects the pelvis. For those of you new to um, our lectures, Ellen has been doing this since, um, my goodness, this is number four, so let's go back. Since <laughs> Does October sound about right? Yes. <laughs> uh, creating some amazing content and the passion behind every lecture is definitely there to inform uh, people with all things um, related to the pelvis. Um, if you're new to AST, Ellen has been with us for uh, many years. Um, she started out as a clinic assistant and she is now one of our expert physiotherapists. Um, if this is your first time listening in on one of the pelvic floor series lectures, I promise you won't be disappointed. Um, Ellen has such a clear, detailed ex way of explaining things. It's, it's quite wonderful. Um, if you have been with us all along, huge thank you. A um, little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions during the lecture, feel free to write them into the chat box. I will be watching for them. If the questions are relevant to the moment, I will interrupt Ellen and ask them for you um, in confidence. And if not, I will review, we can all re review at the end of the lecture. Um, please note that anything pelvic floor related is a potentially sensitive subject. And if you prefer to ask in a private way, there is a way uh, to change your name on Zoom. Ellen's going to share this on her side. Um, and when the lecture is over, feel free to stay on the call and ask any further questions. Uh, I think that's all from me. Uh, please join me in welcoming, wel welcoming Mrs. Ellen Wedemeyer. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you. Um, I just have to share my screen here. Oh, Renee, would you mind letting me share my screen? Oh, yes. That's the one thing we didn't do prior. Well, it's always something. Yeah. Lovely. Here oh, we go. You should be able I to. I should be able to do it now. Perfect. Great. All right. Excellent. So thank you, Renee. Hello, everyone. I am so excited that you're all here. As Renee said, my name is Ellen Wedemeyer. I am both an orthopedic and pelvic floor physiotherapist. So I see everything from ankles to incontinence at Active Sports Therapy. And today we are focusing on how trauma affects the pelvic floor. And I wanted to call it the protective pelvis because I want it to, to, I want everyone to know that the pelvis is just trying its best to protect you, but sometimes it does end up resulting in some issues here and there. Now, Renee already mentioned, I love questions. Please ask questions. We're gonna use the chat box. Now, in order to maintain anonymity, if you would like, all you have to do is change your name. 
So if you go to your little box, there should be three dots in the top right corner. And that should hopefully allow you to change your name. The name that you change it to will be what comes up with the chat box. So it's okay if it's just user or anonymous or Sally Smith, whatever you come up with. And um, that way, if you do want to ask a question, but it's a little sensitive, I don't want that to stop you. So please ask and then Renee will interrupt if we need, if not, we'll do it at the end. Now, something else to talk about, because we are discussing trauma and we are gonna be discussing some specifics of trauma, which is not a good experience, um, there is the chance that it can bring up emotions, um, potentially expected or unexpected. So that can be a lot for some people, especially if you have undergone trauma. And if you've undergone trauma and you've worked past it, or you never even realized that it affected you, but you're having some sort of emotional response, I want you to be nice to yourself. We will be posting this onto our YouTube channel after with all the rest of the lectures. So if at any point I'm talking about something and you are just way too overwhelmed, please stop, walk away. You can always come back later, or you can look at it at a future time at your own pace. So. Um, and I think at the end, I have a little link to where that is, but our YouTube channel, I believe is Active Sports One or Active Sports Therapy One, it's at the end. So if you have to, please, please put yourself first. This is simply information for you. And I want it to be the best for your situation. Um, if you are having an increased stress response and you have a psychologist, please reach out to them. If you have any current grounding techniques or anything like that, please, please use them. Um, and if you're struggling afterwards and you don't really know where to go, please reach out to me via email. Again, my email is at the end of the presentation, but it is simply ellen at activesportstherapy.ca. So if you need me, please reach out. Another <laughs> disclaimer that I didn't add in, usually these are an hour. There is a chance that it might be slightly over an hour just because I, I just couldn't cut anything out. Everything was so important. So I apologize if you're expecting an hour and it's going a little bit over, but I'm gonna try my best. Now, I wanted to credit um, a psychotherapist and trauma specialist from Ontario. Her name is Lisa Aldworth. She is where I got all of my psychological um, stats, components, information from. I am not a psychologist. I do not directly um, deal with any kind of psychological things. I deal with the physical ramifications of the psychological things. So I'm in no way trying to act as an expert on that side, but it is really important that you have the background on what trauma is and what the different types of trauma can entail so that you know what I'm talking about when it comes to the physical side of things. So um, she is where I got most of the information from. She is well-renowned in our pelvic floor community and is a great kind of resource for a lot of us physios. Um, and the rest of it is from Pelvic Health Solutions, which is where I do most of my training. Okay, so trauma is a big word that can mean many, many things. And when trying to find a definition of trauma, it is nearly impossible because there are different definitions left, right, and center. So I took three kind of snippets of definitions that kind of encompassed what they generally mean. So number one, trauma is any experience that causes intense physical or psychological stress reactions. And I want you to remember that stress reactions, that is what then can cause um, issues with pelvic floor and, and throughout the body. Trauma can be an event that threatens or harms a person. Remember, threatening is a part of it. It doesn't have to be physical harm has serious negative effects on physical, emotional, social, and or spiritual well-being. So that means your well-being. It doesn't necessarily have to result in bruises and cuts and scrapes in order to be considered a trauma. And it is an event that causes fear, helplessness, and again, physical stress reactions. So many, many people have experienced some form of trauma, some type of trauma, and that trauma is going to affect everyone differently. And for that reason, it is really important that we're never comparing our traumatic experience to someone else's. You may be in a car accident, the same car accident as your friend, you were driving, they were a passenger, and you might come out with 
eh, maybe some physical harm, but no big repercussions. And your friend might have all sorts of traumatic experiences, PTSD, all sorts of things. Even though you guys were in the same accident, your bodies responded to that accident very differently. So I wanted to say that right at the beginning, because this is really common with some of the trauma that we're discussing, including childbirth. So I never want you to explain a traumatic situation to someone and then be like, oh, I went through the same thing and I'm fine. I don't want that to, to lessen how you are responding to that situation and lessen your reaction to that situation and how your body might physically be responding to it. And trauma is really just, it's a big term. Like I said, it's an umbrella term for so many different things, but basically it's any kind of adverse event. Now, if we were to go over every single type of trauma, this is just a small number in itself. We would be here for hours and hours and hours. So I really wanted to talk about the relationship of trauma to the rest of the body and the pelvic floor. So I, I came into four kind of main types of trauma that tend to pertain to the people that I see most frequently. So either experiences that many of my patients have gone through or ones that could directly impact the pelvic floor. So know that the ones that I am talking about, many of the, the physical reactions are going to be the same with maybe another type of trauma that you've undergone. Um, it could be very similar or the same as the type of traumas that we're discussing. So the ones that we're going to focus on today are sexual trauma, emotional or psychological abuse, both of those of any age, of any type, birth trauma, and that includes both vaginal and cesarean birth, as well as physical trauma. So those are your car accidents, boarding accidents, and whatnot. So now you can see how important it is that if anything is triggering, um, unfortunately, I do have to I have to use details in order to teach and in order for people to have information. And so if any kind of detail is making you uncomfortable, that's where I really want you to step away and we can sort it out later. So sexual abuse generally in literature um, tends to get split up into childhood and adulthood sexual abuse. And one is not worse or more effective on the body than the other. But we do know that childhood sexual abuse is any time, basically up to the early 20s, when the brain is still developing. And it is encompassed by any kind of developmental trauma. And it is really important to discuss because it has some specific kind of ramifications to our physical bodies into adulthood. Now, if we take a step back simply to sexual abuse as a whole, its legal definition is any act that violates the sexual dignity of another person. So that does not mean that there needs to be touch in order for it to be sexual abuse. And it's really important because that's what a lot of kids go through. Yes, unfortunately, there are some, some physical um, unwanted touch of some type, but it can also include inappropriate conversation it can be showing inappropriate things, pictures or videos. It could be um, texting inappropriately. There's no reason why a random adult that is not part of the, the web of the family is texting the child, especially if it's an inappropriate content. So it's really important that sexual abuse, especially in childhood, is not just considered physical, but it does include any unwanted touch. So, um, Obviously, like we have our, our main ones that people think of that involve some sort of penetration, but it can simply be touched that is unwarranted and unwanted. And always coming back to that idea of the sexual dignity of that person being violated. Now, right up top there, 33% of women and 14% of men are survivors of childhood sexual abuse. That is a huge number. And this was taken from a study um, that was cisgendered men and women. Now, if you start to look into the LGBTQ plus community, it is significantly higher, which is just awful. So there are oh, so many people out there. Yeah. Oh, that's a chicken broth. I made up for her. Sorry, I might yeah. forget whoever's talking oh, to the oh, mute. ACT. Or Renee, if you want to mute. Yeah, I'm working on it. Tracy, <laughs> I have um, to... is it possible to... Uh... Mute your, I 
you keep jumping back and forth and I can't get to you, but um, if we could just make sure that every, oh, thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Sorry, I just, I get too distracted. I can't talk over people. Okay, so very, very significantly high numbers of people have undergone some sort of sexual abuse. So especially in childhood. And that means that many people in your life might be experiencing um, the ramifications of that later on, even if they have worked beyond it. Now, really anything that increases the stress response can be considered um, a trauma. So that can also be the fear of someone um, going towards physical abuse or the fear that is elicited by inappropriate conversations or pictures or anything like that. Now, I already discussed development tra trauma up to the early 20s, and that's because of brain development, right? Our brains keep going until even the mid 20s. So what we experience as a child is going to then affect how our body develops, both um, physically and psychologically. So we do have those ramifications later on. Now, the other issue is that, especially in childhood, many people don't get treatment, and that's because they don't tell people. Only 5% are reported to police. And I would love to know the percentage of even ones that are reported to parents or trusted adults, right? And that's because maybe it's a coach and you don't want to affect your playing time. There's a lot of shame that goes around it. And so if the kids aren't necessarily getting treatment for that, whether it's physical or psychological, then it can be taken into um, their neurological responses and can result in an increase in pelvic pain. There's a really, really strong correlation with childhood sexual abuse specifically and chronic pelvic pain and feeling out of touch with the body. And I really wanted to add that in there because childhood is when you're getting in touch with the body. That's when you're learning how to move, how to play, how a muscle works. The fact that you can squeeze this muscle and your hand comes up, it's very exciting. So it's when you're, you're really getting in touch with how your body works. And if you have an experience that dissociates you from that, it can impact how you develop physically. Now, none of this, I should, should have said this at the beginning, I'm not trying to scare anyone. What I'm trying to do is help people make connections that maybe they, are, they have this weird pain at the top of their pelvis and has had it for 30 years and then can go back to, you know what, I had that abuse situation when I was seven. And that there could be some sort of connection with that. And so just giving people as much information as possible. So I'm really sorry if I'm scaring anyone. Um, that's not the intent. It's just trying to get everyone um, enough information to make those connections if needed. Okay, then we look at sexual abuse in adulthood. Sexual abuse is sexual abuse. It is the same thing that we went over. It is sometimes physical, but it doesn't have to be. It can be verbal, visual, non-contact. It can be voyeurism. Um, it can be keeping toms, it can be anything like that where you feel violated. Now, something to think about is that whether you are a child or an adult, generally there's some sort of power differential that allows for the sexual abuse. So that might be a boss or someone in the family that just has control over you, especially in adulthood, a big one is just that the other person is simply bigger and is taking advantage of an opportunity, or maybe um, you are inebriated and the other person is sober, that is a power differential. So those power differentials allow other people to, to try and take advantage of you, and then it puts you into a fight, flight, or freeze response. It is really important that people know that freeze is part of the fight, flight, or freeze, and is a completely common response. Um, the freeze response tends to be associated with more shame and um, less treatments. And that is, it is not uncommon. And I don't want anyone to feel bad if that is their general response. Um, many, many people that undergo sexual abuse will develop PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And that is where if someone, if someone says to someone with PTSD, just get over it, people need to know that, that that's not how PTSD works right? It, it's where you continue to relive. And that's important for us to know because in, as I go along this presentation, I'm going to start talking about what the stress response means. And if you are continuously reliving a situation, it's going to continuously bring you back into this stress response, which is where we get our physical ramifications. Okay. So slightly different is emotional or psychological abuse. 
Um, and this is any non-physical behavior that is the intent is to belittle another person. And it's basically anything that's emotional rather than physical in nature. It is a very, very big umbrella. Again, generally some sort of power imbalance. And that is why people have to endure it for a long time. Not have to, but they feel like they have to. Um, for example, bullying bosses. You need to work. And so you get stuck in this process of someone continuously belittling you. There are three major categories of emotional abuse. One, aggressing. So that is very direct. That is blaming, shaming, name calling. Um, intimidation is a really, really big one. It is very direct. You are awful because blank. Then we also have denying and withholding. And this is a big one that tends to get overlooked. And so it could be a refusal to be pleased. It could be that person in your life that you are constantly trying to please and it's just never working, you're never good enough, that is a form of emotional abuse. Same with controlling money. If you are in a relationship and the other person is in control of the bank account, maybe they're making all the money, you end up trapped because they're not allowing you to have any money so you can't do anything, that's emotional abuse. Same with minimizing. Gaslighting is absolutely huge and thankfully it's, it's becoming um, more kind of relevant in our society and how many people know what's going on, but gaslighting again is also emotional abuse. Now, this is very, very frequently a large, if not the bigger part of an abusive relationship, and it can be a precursor to physical violence, uh, but sometimes it is the abuse in itself and it can absolutely have physical ramifications. Now, just like I said, any kind of abuse will increase the stress response. So that is going to make you into a fight or flight. You are stressed out. The body is stressed out. And this leads to physical reactions and changes. And I'm going to discuss those a little bit later. But these changes can be the same or similar to those who undergo physical harm. So even if you are trying to kind of downplay, oh, it was just emotional, it was just emotional, it is still going to create potentially, always potentially, um, physical reactions and changes by the body based on that stress response. So you can absolutely correlate pain to something that hurt you just without a bruise forming. All right, number three, birth trauma. Birth trauma is big, and I'm probably going to spend the longest time talking about this because, again, very large umbrella that involves both physical and psychological aspects. Now, I'm going to break down birth trauma has a very long definition, but I'm going to break it down as we go. But basically it is a psychological condition resulting from a birthing experience. So that can be any kind of vaginal, cesarean, hospital, home, any kind of birthing experience in which a birthing person experienced or perceived, underline, underline, bold, bold, perceived physical or psychological harm towards themselves or their baby. So we're going to take a little step back. It can be towards themselves or their baby. And that's absolutely huge. It does not just have to be um, a cut or tear directly to the birthing person. It can be that the baby is undergoing some sort of stress as well, it can affect the parent. Now, the reason I bolded and underlined and did a million things verbally to perceived is yes, you could have actually experienced a physical trauma or a psychological trauma or anything like that. But even if you simply think that, uh, truly believe that something is going wrong, it can also elicit the stress response. For example, if you were in the birthing process and you heard one nurse mutter something about a heartbeat to the other nurse, you might instantly panic, right? Something's happening to the baby. The baby's not okay. Um, or you might hear the doctor mention a possibility of a cesarean if you're having a vaginal birth or something that you weren't expecting. And they could potentially be talking about the person next door. But if you heard that and you kind of go into that panic, then you can still have this entire stress response. Now, something to think about is that birth trauma can come from feelings based on not having the birth experience that you wanted or expected. So you don't have to have this situation where you almost died giving birth to have birth trauma. And that's really important 
to not only understand, but accept just in case this is something that you went through and, and you wanna be able to kind of figure out what the heck is going on. So for example, if you are expecting to have a cesarean, maybe you scheduled your cesarean for January 12th, but then you went into labor a day early and you, you're well on your way to a vaginal birth, then that is completely different than what you expected. Same going the other way. You really wanted to give an unmedicated vaginal birth at home. And all of a sudden you are going to the hospital or you're having an emergency C-section or someone is saying you have to have medication or anything like that. Any of those things can be part of a traumatic birth experience. Another thing too is if baby ends up staying in the hospital, if we have an acute visit or something um, just isn't going to plan um, with directly after the birth, that can also play into any kind of trauma, which is going to be that um, stressful response. Now, something else to think about is birth is one of the only times in life where you undergo a potentially traumatic event and then have to take care of an infant. So a lot of times people undergo this experience, but don't really get the opportunity to unpack what just happened because they're now trying to, to care for their new family member. Now, cultural constructions can also kind of play a part in birth trauma. And what that means is basically how our culture perceives pregnancy and birth. So for example, pregnancy is supposed to be a really positive experience, right? That's all you really hear about is, oh, glowing mom, the hair is growing beautifully, um, the nails are growing really long, oh, you can feel your baby kick. It's very um, positive when we hear about it in media or anything like that, which is amazing. And I, I wish that all pregnancies were like that. But for some people, it is awful you might be sick for nine months straight. Some people can't keep anything down. Some people are sore from basically anywhere around the pelvis for a long time. Some people are incredibly fatigued, but we don't necessarily have the support for that side because every time you see someone, they're going, oh, you're glowing, right? And so when someone says something like that, or they, they're coming with a really positive attitude. Sometimes it feels wrong to be like, I'm exhausted and I need help. So that positive experience is fantastic. But for those that aren't having that, sometimes the cultural construction can actually um, add on to that isolation. Now, same with birth. Birth is seen as this exciting experience. Birth is magical, right? How often do you hear that? Which Again, I really wish upon everyone a magical birthing experience. And for some people, it truly is. But for others, it's not. And some people, again, not trying to scare anyone. Um, I, I personally have not had kids and still want them. Um, but sometimes we have to be open to the possibility of negative experiences. Um, and because if they do happen, it can really, if you're not ready for them, it can, it can absolutely increase the trauma. Um, and also many aspects of birth can be out of your control. And this is where I'm gonna struggle a little bit, but you can have every single plan, plan A to F. Um, and sometimes it's just baby has another idea, life has another idea, and that can be really, really hard for people, especially when you're used to being in control. Okay, then the last thing um, that's kind of related to the cultural constructions is that directly after birth, you dive into motherhood. So motherhood is, is part of this whole journey and motherhood is beautiful and it is powerful, power to the mother. And again, that is incredible. And moms out there, you are incredibly powerful. I am so impressed. But also as soon as you give birth, people stop asking about you. Then they start asking about baby right? You were so strong. You got through that birth. How is baby? How is baby doing? Is baby sleeping? Rarely do they ask, is mom sleeping? Right? So we tend to maybe have some support during pregnancy, but some of that support gets taken away once we dive into that motherhood process, which is part of the whole birthing process. So the best way to kind of sum that up is 
giving birth often results in both the best and the worst day of your life simultaneously. And that can be really confusing for the brain, for the body, for your neurological system. So it can be involved in some sort of trauma or trauma response. Now, specific causes of birth trauma can kind of um, be teased out into sections. So I took three main ones. One of them is physical harm can be involved in the birthing process, unfortunately. So we can have unwanted interventions. This can include um, basically anything that is not within your consent or wasn't within your plan. So it could be medication that you weren't planning on having. It could be having to use forceps or vacuum, um, an emergency cesarean section. All of those things can cause tearing or um, in the case of a cesarean, you're, you now have a surgical scar. Um, those can be considered physical harm. Also, unwanted positioning and movements can be considered physical harm. Um, for example, the when you're lying on your back giving birth, um, sometimes that's not necessarily the best thing for your body and can increase the risk of um, tailbone issues, for example, or um, certain tearing. Or maybe you really wanted to labor in a standing position or in a kneeling position or go for walks and you're unable to. And so then we end up getting um, seizing into the hips or something like that. There, there's a lot of physical kind of harm situations that can occur. Um, medical, medical mistakes, unfortunately, anytime we have a medical procedure, we are at risk for that. And we always want to remember labor. So a long and painful labor can absolutely be considered harm. And same with very fast labor. Is that anyone's fault? No, but you're still sore and in pain and it can still be harmful. Something else that um, can cause that birth trauma or that trauma response is a stillbirth, a miscarriage, or a termination. These all tend to be very unrecognized losses and your body still changed, your heart still changed, your mind still changed in some way, and then there is a loss. So especially in these ones, some people may not even know that they occurred. Um, if it's early on in a pregnancy, you might not have even let people know that you were pregnant yet. And so what could have been a decent support system is very small because people didn't even realize you went through a loss. And oftentimes after going through a loss, you don't necessarily want to talk about it. So you're not going to call someone up and maybe explain what's going on. I hope that you would, but a lot of people wouldn't be comfortable with that or it's just you're not up for it. So these are things that absolutely can be considered part of birth trauma. Something else to consider is that it's even tougher when you already have kids at home because you undergo this loss where we want to grieve and let the body heal. Um, and it can be really hard if there are children at home because you are, you have to go back and be parent. You have to go take care of them, right? And so you don't necessarily have that time to yourself. And specifically with something like termination, there is technically choice involved. Sometimes it doesn't feel like choice, um, but that can be really, really hard psychologically. Um, even if, if it is the best decision and props to you, I will never judge anyone for any decision on that. Um, but I know that that can be psychologically taxing as well and can absolutely be part of the birth trauma kind of umbrella. Now, we can also have psychological harm involved in the birth. So something to think about is that labor and delivery tend to, not tend to be, I shouldn't say that, can be depersonalizing for the mom or the birthing person because they become just this vessel for baby to come out of, right? And they turn into less of the, the direct care person um, and more just like, let's keep her alive or them alive so that baby can get out. And that can be really, really challenging on our psyche. Um, there's also loss of control, a lot of vulnerability, as you can imagine. Um, and anytime there's loss of choice, it actually physically compromises the brain's ability to feel safe. So a lot of times you may not realize it, but when you're prepping for birth, you're going through imagery exercises. You're imagining yourself, okay, I'm going to I'm giving birth at Stove Health Campus, let's say. So you're picturing that in your mind as you're thinking about it. And you're like, okay, well, like apparently the maternity ward is on this floor and blah, blah, blah. And you're probably walking through it. 
And then all of a sudden that might change, or maybe you're planning a home birth and then you have to go to the hospital. All of a sudden the brain is going, that's not what I planned. That's not what I prepared for. So we have less of that ability to feel safe throughout the process. Um, something that I'll note is male staff. Sometimes people are uncomfortable with male staff, but that might be the only option. Um, and so that can also kind of play with triggers of that trauma. Um, also things patronizing, we see that throughout healthcare, sadly, um, but being treated in a patronizing manner is never nice. And then pressure to be a good patient. So a lot of people might have a plan, but then doctor or nurse or whoever they're talking with is like, no, you should do it this way. And instead of being like, no, I want to do it my way, you're like, well, sure, let's not argue, I'm in pain. Um, and honestly, if you do that, that's fine, but you might still have it at the back of your head that you wanted to do it that other way. And your brain knows that and is reading that and you're still having a bit of a stress response. So always remember back to that power differential that we discussed when we were talking about previous abuses. We also have that differential between a birthing person and their medical caregiver. And so we always wanna watch any kind of power differentials. Um, I just wanted to throw this in here that a, an effect of birth trauma can be PTSD. And PTSD is very frequently mistaken for postpartum mood disorders, depression, anxiety, anything like that, because um, symptoms are quite similar. But generally, with PTSD, you, it involves re-experiencing that trauma, and it can be increased with isolation postpartum. So um, that's definitely something that people want to go and try to get sorted out, because it is very different than um, a postpartum mood disorder, and is treated differently. Now, basically, a lot of mothers will minimize their negative birth experiences because they don't think anyone wants to hear about it. And people are asking about baby and people might not even realize that they have this until life gets back to normal. And back to normal might be once kids are back in, or in school five years later or even later on, or if they're considering having another baby and all of a sudden they're having these terrible responses with anxious or anything like that. Um, purely because they're even considering having another pregnancy, um, and that can be a sign of birth trauma. Now, just something to note, for all the new moms out there, new parents out there that had to deal with COVID and birthing, there are definitely um, increased, I guess, factors in birth trauma that happened um, between having to choose between um a mom being there and a partner being there or a doula being there or not being able to move around or having to birth in masks. All of those things um, did increase the risk of birth trauma. It did not increase, like it doesn't mean that you had birth trauma. If you gave birth during COVID, you might've had a wonderful experience, but um, there are just different scenarios that have come up with our lovely pandemic. Now, last thing on birth trauma that I promise I'm moving on, Caregivers and partners can absolutely also have effects of trauma. And um, so if you are the partner or maybe you gave birth and had trauma and you're seeing your partner struggling or you're seeing it through friends, it is 100% possible to have physical and psychological effects when you're trying to care for the person who underwent the trauma. So please be, be patient with people and try to help them as well. Now, the last kind of trauma we'll discuss is physical trauma. So that includes basically any kind of accidents, um, injuries that you can think of. So there could be direct trauma to the pelvis that can include fractures in the pelvis or the hip, um, sports injuries, uh, especially like if there's impact to the pelvis region, um, you're probably gonna see increased tension through the hips and the groins or anything like that groin. Um, as you are kind of playing or undergoing injuries um, and car accidents, motor vehicle accidents can 100% involve direct trauma to the pelvis. It could be coming through the hip. It could be um, based on any kind of, all the accidents are different, but sometimes physics wise, it does allow direct trauma. We can also have indirect trauma to the pelvis. So again, car accidents, you might have just whiplash, um, but that can also increase um, issues in through pelvis and pelvic floor. Um, physical abuse to areas other than the pelvis are considered indirect trauma to the pelvis. And basically any accident in which your stress response was heightened, you were scared, you saw it coming, you weren't sure what to do, anything where you might've reacted or flinched can affect the pelvis as well. Now, this is 
all the people that we're seeing elsewhere in clinic, not necessarily pelvic floor. And we want to remember that other muscles work in tandem with our pelvic floor muscles. So in my last lecture, we talked about the relationship between the pelvic floor and the diaphragm and the low back and the deep abs to create our stability. So if one of those is going wrong, it's going to affect all the other ones. In terms of the hip muscles, there's actually a hip muscle that is so deep that you can only feel it if you go internally, either vaginally or rectally. So I hope that shows how close everything is and how easily they could kind of impact and relate to each other. Um, same with the groin, all those muscles that come up and attach right onto the front of the pelvis, they're gonna impact the pelvic floor as well. So that whole region, everything is affecting each other. And as soon as those are affected, everything else can get out of whack. If your hip's not working, your knee could be affected. If you're not standing, right, your shoulder could be affected. There's so many different things that can come back to the pelvic floor not cooperating. Um, another thing, and this is kind of fun, so if you feel like it and know how to squeeze your pelvic floor, if you stand up and pigeon toe, and so put your toes closer than your heels, and then squeeze and lift that pelvic floor, and then relax, and then put your toes out and do the same thing, you're likely gonna feel a little bit different. Same with if you tilt your pelvis forward and kind of untuck your tail and give a squeeze and then tilt your pelvis backwards and give a little squeeze and lift, it's gonna feel different. And the reason that those things affect the pelvic floor is it's actually um, changing the length of the pelvic floor muscles. And all muscles work the best when they're in their mid range. That's kind of the goal is if we can get muscles into their mid length, then they're probably gonna be strongest. And so if you are walking funny, where maybe like after another accident and all of a sudden your toe is out, then you are changing the pelvic floor length on that side, which can then tighten the pelvic floor, which can then radiate into other parts of the pelvis and can change how you're using your core. So you can very quickly see how everything is so interconnected and a piece of the puzzle that tends to get forgotten is the pelvic floor. So you can either have direct injury or indirect injury that can both affect and be affected by the pelvic floor. And um, they can, the symptoms can start long after actual injury. So um, to talk about what's actually happening in the body is super important. So after trauma, we can sometimes believe that the body is not safe. We can have disconnect from the body. We can ignore signals like discomfort. That's a good one to remember. Um, basically, especially if you are having continuous trauma or you are triggered by many things, you are basically always alert and ready for danger. That ongoing fight or flight response can happen. Um, there's an increased chance of anxiety and panic attacks. There are physical changes to the pelvic floor, potentially right? You could, you could have actual cuts and bruises and scrapes and tears in through the pelvic floor region. Um, say you had a cesarean, now you're going to have something in the abdomen. Um, you can also have biomechanical changes. So after trauma, positioning can change. And I might as well just talk about this now. Our protective response in the body is generally fetal position. So we're kind of cowering a little bit. So shoulders are probably coming forward. Ribs are gonna drop down, neck is gonna go into a weird position, everything up here is gonna tighten up to try and protect you. And what's happening at the pelvis is we're tucking our tail under. If you think of a dog, if you are near a dog and you slam a door and they jump and weren't expecting it, their tail goes right under their bum and they kind of swoop under, we do the same thing. And so it kind of puts us in that position. Now, if we are consistently having a traumatic or stress response, then that can become our new normal. And so now our tail is tucked, our ribs are not in a great position, we're holding a lot of tension in through the shoulders. When we tuck our tails, it shortens our pelvic floor. So when we tuck that tail under, our pelvic floor muscles go into a shortened position. And if they stay there or they're, and they're in a lot for a long time, that becomes their new normal. And that can be perceived as tension. And the body can read that as a new normal. So if it lengthens, it panics and it contracts back to that position. So we can definitely see increase in pelvic floor tension simply due to positioning changes. 
And I just made a note at the bottom, a very common effect of sexual trauma is chronic pelvic pain. And we'll get into that right away. So now what we're gonna do, oh gosh, I'm so sorry, guys. I'm gonna be a little bit over that hour mark. It's just so important. Um, but we're gonna go into some very specific kind of pelvis, um, pelvic floor-ish related um, issues that can directly be associated with or caused by some sort of pain. So chronic pelvic pain is basically any pain between the belly button and the hip bones, and it has to last for more than six months. And that's pretty much the extent of it. And it just can't be caused by anything else. Like you rule out any other um, medical condition. So it can be pain that is sharp, dull, steady, on and off. Pretty much anything you can think of, pressure in through any of that region. And generally the symptoms will increase with any kind of sexual activity, including intercourse or other penetration, urination or bowel movements, and prolonged sitting. So basically any activity that involves the pelvic or perineal region will increase the pain. So your pain could be kind of up higher in the pelvis, but it gets so much worse every time you urinate. That can be a chronic pelvic pain situation. Now, I'm saying women here because it was a study done by cisgendered women um, that showed that chronic pain has these results, but um, most people are going to have very, very similar results. And it is higher muscle floor, pelvic floor, muscle tone, um, and tone is tension, um, reduced strength or ability to use the strength, decreased relaxation capacity, which is bolded because that means unable to consciously relax, and increased muscle tenderness in through there. So that would be on palpation. So what I'm trying to say is basically people with general chronic pain, but especially pelvic pain, almost always have a very direct pelvic floor component where it is pulling, it is not being used properly, and we can't consciously relax it. And it is a very, very common effect of sexual trauma at any age, but especially in childhood. And so that can be where you could have undergone some sort of trauma when you were eight or nine and are having these effects when you're 40 and there could be a potentially um, direct relationship between the two. Now, other conditions are vulvar pain. So this is just kind of a general umbrella condition. And that's basically pain anywhere in the vulvar region. And the vulvar region is anything that's just outside of the vagina. So any of the labia, um, kind of any of the, I've heard them called flaps, not very specific, but anything in that region, um, perineal body, which is the region between the anus and the vagina, basically anything in that area. And the pain can affect our ability to sit. If you have a vulva, um, participate in any kind of sexual activity, not necessarily penetration, um, tampon insertion can be difficult if we have vulvar pain. Um, it can be tough to clean properly after we toilet because you don't wanna touch. Um, and there are many, many different causes of vulvar pain, but a few of them can be female genital cutting, which would be a physical trauma, obstetrical damage, oh boy, um, which is basically any kind of birthing um, trauma, especially tears and cuts, and then damage from assault. So a lot of those can actually have physical damage leading to physical ramifications of vulvar pain. We can also look at vaginismus. And I should say, technically, in order to be diagnosed with vaginismus, it needs to basically, the cause needs to be unknown. But people who have undergone trauma can have a very similar response. I just, it doesn't have the same name. But it's basically a spasm of vaginal muscles, which prohibits any penetration. Like nothing can go in, including a tampon. Um, and it involves tension, pain, or burning when you are attempting any kind of penetration. So it's basically, it just locks down on you. And so, especially those who have had trauma to that area or um, potential trauma to that area and have had a stress response, the body could use this as a protective response in the future. Now, dyspareunia is painful penetration. So um, vaginismus is painful and you can't penetrate at all. This is, it's painful, but you can still have some sort of penetration. Um, and this is really frequent in people who are postpartum, including three months. So that six week follow up doesn't necessarily mean that your your body is fully ready for things, even if you get cleared there. Now, 
a lot of causes that are related to trauma can be um, painful scars or episiotomies post-birth, um, some sort of protective response. Again, that can be from either physical or emotional trauma of any type, overactive pelvic floor dysfunction, um, which can be caused by any of those traumas, and basically general sensitization. So this is one where painful penetration of any type can very frequently be um, related to some sort of trauma and trauma response. Now, dysmenorrhea is when it's painful cramps and technically painful cramps are not normal. They're incredibly common, but they are not normal. They are a sign of some sort of issues. And there are many, many different causes. And sometimes we just have unfortunate genetics, but a history of sexual assault can also be the cause or correlated with um, painful, very painful cramping. Coccyx pain, your coccyx is your tailbone. So that's basically any pain in the tailbone. It's worse in certain positions and with certain kind of movements, but causes can include physical trauma. So a fall, uh, that darn ice, um, vaginal birth, because if you think of the, the opening and your little tailbone right at the back, especially based on your positioning. Um, sometimes that tailbone can actually have impact by baby as baby's coming out. Um, inflammation can cause pain in through there and pelvic floor dysfunction. And this is important because there are muscles that actually attach onto the tailbone. And so if those guys are getting really tight and they're pulling on that tailbone, it can cause pain. So sometimes it can be um, very directly related to a muscular issue. It's just not caught because everyone's just working on the glutes. Now, last condition is anal fissures, um, which are kind of exactly what they say. They're basically micro tears in through the anal canal, right at the opening. Um, this causes pain with and after bowel movements. And you will see, I shouldn't say you will, you may, but very frequently see bright red blood on toilet paper. So it's basically little fissures or little tears that are opening with every bowel movement. Um, and they can become very chronic and deep and they are not fun. And they oftentimes are also related to trauma. So that can include stressing uh, or stretching late of the anal mucosa. So basically um, if the anus is stretched beyond its capacity, which could happen with a trauma um, or penetration that is inappropriate. And it can also help happen with consensual um, sexual acts. So be careful out there, lots of lubricant. But childbirth trauma can also happen because you can have tearing um, from the vaginal region towards the anus. You can also get it from excessive wiping with toilet paper. Um, that can be a physical trauma because it can be very abrasive to that region and create the tearing into there. And also tension in the pelvic floor. So if you have really really high tone or tension in that pelvic floor and you're having a hard time relaxing, then it's going to force you to strain to do a bowel movement. And that strain can also cause the fissuring. So always remember the men. A lot of times we just think of the women or those with vagina as we go through this, but anyone with a penis and testicles can also have many of these issues. And some of them are specific to pain in the testicles and scrotum that are really similar to that kind of general vulgar pain I talked about. So don't forget them. They can absolutely have a trauma response as well. Now, this is the bread and butter of why I wanted to do this. And this is explaining really how our body responds to trauma and how that directly impacts the pelvic floor. So to take a lot of physiology classes and try to jam it into two minutes, we have our nervous system that controls our body. And the autonomic nervous system is basically an automatic nervous system. It's gonna handle your heart and your lungs and your eyes and sweating and basically anything that's gonna keep you alive where we just can't trust us to think about it. So if we had to think every time we took a breath, we would not do well. So that's the autonomic nervous system or involuntary nervous system. Now that is split into sympathetic and parasympathetic. So the sympathetic system is what hypes us up. It increases our muscle tension. We are ready to go. It'll increase our heart rate, increase our, our breathing rate. It's basically there to protect us. So if you all of a sudden have to jump out of the way of something or 
run away from an angry lion, it is ready to go right away and it'll get the body ready to go. Then on the other side, we have our parasympathetic system and that's our rest and digest system. It's supposed to chill us out, let us kind of get our resources back and just calm us down. So those things are supposed to work in tandem. So we kind of elevate and then we come back down and then we elevate and then we come back down. And so our systems can be perfectly happy and we can live our lives. But what trauma does is it impacts that balance. So we elevate and then we stay there and we don't have that rest and digest program in our body going on. So we get stuck. Now that can lead to the sympathetic nervous system basically getting wound up and wound up and continuing. And that can lead to increased tension and pain and decreased um, movement through the upper back, the lower back, the SI joints, um, the tailbone, basically the diaphragm, which is our breathing muscle and our pelvic floor both become upregulated, which means they're always on, which doesn't work since they're supposed to relax and contract at opposite times. So if they're both contracting, that doesn't help. So basically a really nice way of looking at it is that the sympathetic nervous system turns on, then it releases pro-inflammatory peptides, basically inflammation. Um, inflammation is not necessarily bad. It is there for our body. It, it helps us heal. It helps us know what's going on. But when we have too much inflammation or it continues and doesn't get flushed, that's when we have issues. And that's where it can irritate the tissue, which then creates an increased sympathetic response, more peptides, more irritation, and so on and so forth. So what's important to note is that in chronic stress, which is a very common side effect of trauma, our sympathetic nervous system is basically staying on. And that nervous system is very expensive. It uses all of our resources. So it's using up everything, but it's not giving us the opportunity for that parasympathetic to slide in and let us relax and get that restoration that we need. So that can interfere with digestion, metabolism, hormones, lots of sleep issues, psychological issues, constipation, because you're not getting that rest and digest. Um, and so basically trauma leads to chronic stress, which leads to um, sympathetic response, which leads to a bunch of stuff that is just no fun. Now, if we look at it specific to the pelvic floor in a really kind of simple way is you're undergoing a trauma. Again, that can be emotional, physical, any kind of trauma where you are stressed out or nervous or worried or angry or anything like that. Then fight, flight, or freeze kicks in. That is our sympathetic response. It is trying to protect us. That could involve very specific engagement of pelvic floor muscles, or it could be the whole body. Um, all the muscles are tense and ready to go, but basically the pelvic floor tenses up. We also go into that protective position that I talked about. So our tail is now tucked, which shortens the pelvic floor, which tightens the pelvic floor. So now we have it coming from two directions. Then we, whatever the dangerous situation is, is completed. But for some reason, the body doesn't think that you're safe yet and continues to be in a stress response. So that can usually come from uh, continued fear or um, simply the body going rogue on us. And then the parasympathetic system doesn't kick in, so we can't come back down. And so we continue to be in this fight or flight. And then this can result in pelvic floor tension because it's not getting a chance to relax because it's always on the go. It's ready to protect you. And that can lead to basically all of the discussed, um, the things that I just discussed from vulvar pain to tailbone pain there, anything in between. So it's trauma, stress, stay stressed, pelvic floor is trying to help, not really effectively. And then we get some sort of symptoms. So you don't take anything else from today. Your pelvic floor is really trying. It is trying to help protect you. It's just sometimes not helpful anymore. So last thing that we're going to do, I know we're at an hour now, but if you give me like 10 more minutes, I can kind of circle back to the specific traumas that we discussed and how those, now that we know how the stress response works, how they are going to affect us um, with kind of current symptoms. So if we look at sexual abuse or trauma, what happens during the event is that fight or flight response. 
And especially if there is any kind of sexual trauma that is involving the pelvic region or perineal region, you're gonna have extra tensing because those muscles are trying to protect you and your womb. It's a very um, natural response, especially in women or people who were born with vaginas, is our innate nature is, is to try and protect our ability to procreate and continue on our generations of humans. And so it is trying to protect a really important and vital organ. And so you're gonna see that big, big clench. Then what happens after is for some reason, and this could be many reasons, your body doesn't deem you safe, especially for those that are around the abuser frequently or around situations that kind of trigger that response. You could be continuously going into that same fight or flight response. You can have dissociation with the pelvic region. You can have dissociation with feelings in the pelvic region. And you can get similar responses with many future situations, including ones that you are willingly putting yourself into. So it could be a consensual act that you are ready, you are very comfortable with your partner, but your body is reminded of this previous traumatic event and will go, will go into that fight or flight response and you might see that tension. So what does that result in? What, what does that mean? And pain is one of them. So we can get pain in the perineal region, throughout the rest of the pelvis, in the hips, in the back. And all of those can be related to specific tension of those muscles that are just tight, tight, tight. Or in the case of the back, it could be that since it's tight, 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 it can't work with our core piston that we've talked about in the past. So we're not able to stabilize properly. So your back muscles have to stand up. Also, like I said, even if it's a consensual act during sexual activity, you might have pain and it's because you're tensing up, even if consciously you're trying not to. Um, urgency and urge incontinence is a big one because, and I talked about this in my incontinence lecture, but basically urgency is the need that you have to pee right now. Like there's no pass and go, don't collect $200, get to the bathroom right away. That is urgency. And it is very, very frequently associated with tension in the pelvic floor muscle. But what we also need to think of is, as I mentioned on the last slide, sometimes we can get dissociation with that region and with the um, feelings of discomfort. And a feeling of discomfort is sometimes needing to pee. So you might miss the first few signals that your body's trying to give you of, okay, bladder's filling, we're at 60%, like, Maybe we should start thinking about peeing, right? And so all of a sudden they only get that response when it's like, I have to go right now. So sometimes that can happen as well. Um, and the last thing is the inability to connect to the pelvic floor. So you might see um, the inability to consciously get the core working because that's part of it. The inability to consciously relax the pelvic floor. So you might now know I have a really tight pelvic floor, but if you don't have a connection with it, it's really hard to consciously relax. So that, that's what we work on uh, if you're coming to clinic is kind of making that connection. And um, a big one too, is that you may not be willing to kind of look at that area or anything like that. So if there's something that's going on, you might not realize until it's a little bit too late. So that can be another kind of result of any of that trauma. Now, emotional abuse is very, very similar because we had all of those same responses, but a big thing to think of is generally emotional abuse is repetitive. And so if you are consistently going through that fight or flight response, there's a greater chance that your body is going to just adapt to that and create this new normal. And there's less of a chance that that parasympathetic response is going to kind of kick in for you. And so we're just continuously holding tension in that pelvic floor. Um, and something else to think of too is future situations can elicit similar responses, including areas that you go to all the time. So if your emotional abuse was when you were a kid and you were being bullied, every time you go to school, even if the bullies aren't there, you're gonna have some sort of response where your body's trying to protect you. Same with work. If you are being emotionally abused by a coworker, even if that coworker is not in your office, Every time you go to your office, you might have that response. And so it's just this very constant sympathetic response. So what does that result in? Similar to last time, tension, 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 which is causing pain. 
And so you can have pain throughout the whole pelvis um, and radiating into different areas as well, as well as that urgency because we have tension in the pelvic floor. And so we need to get there now. Now, birth trauma, again, we're going into fight or flight for whatever reason. So maybe you're panicking because you are no longer following the plan or you're panicking because you're in danger or baby's in danger, some sort of stress response. You can also have the physical trauma of a cut, a tear, um, stretching of tissue. Um, maybe you had to go get cesarean, so you got some trauma to the abdomen. Um, and so you, you might have both kind of physical and um, psycho yeah, psychological trauma or emotional trauma. Um, and also, please remember that the pelvic floor can be affected in a cesarean birth as well. Um, sometimes if you are laboring, at all, the pelvic floor is going to be changing. And also your pelvis changes for birth, whether it knows you're getting a C-section or not. So um, you might see the pelvis kind of opening up and being ready. The pelvic floor is still holding on to baby um, and kind of keep it, keeping them up there and everything else up there. So we do have impacts of the pelvic floor, even if you have a cesarean birth. Um, and then basically after the event, you now have an infant that you're taking care of. So if you had physical trauma, that tissue needs to heal, but sometimes we don't really give it what it needs because now you have a child or children to take care of. Um, sometimes the stress can be maintained after the event, especially if you can't unpack what happened. Um, if very traumatic, and remember that that's a personal response. So very traumatic can mean anything. Um, it can result in PTSD and other psychological issues as well. And postnatal can be a stressful time. And so you can have your eleva elevated fight or flight during birth, and then it continues as you go postnatally. So what does this result in? Again, pain, but it can also be tissue damage in perineum, in through the pelvis, in through the hips and back based on positioning and what's going on. Um, and you can have pain during sexual activity due to psychological fight or flight or impact to damaged tissues. Um, so there's kind of a lot of things going on there. And eventually we can't forget about things like incontinence that can happen based on how the body has changed from pregnancy and through a birth. So we do have um, many, many different results that can, from any kind of birthing trauma. Okay, last one, physical trauma, not too far over. Um, again, I kind of went over this when we were doing the physical trauma portion, but there's either direct or indirect. Um, impact, but especially if it's a physical trauma where you either know it's coming or it's very severe, your body is going to try and protect the brain and the spinal cord and the heart, basically, are the big three. It's like, as long as these things are working, um, we're alive in the, in the eyes of the nervous system. So everything is going to tense up and try to protect around that. So this is why a lot of times, um, will get like whiplash that can last a really long time. And it's because of that protective response, that stress response that hasn't been able to come down for whatever reason. So if we think of the spinal cord, if the spinal cord ends in our sacrum, our pelvic floor literally comes right up to the sacrum. So it's gonna be tensing up to try and do its part as well. So any kind of traumatic event is going to elicit some sort of trauma response. Again, we are in our sympathetic, not letting our parasympathetic come in. Um, and so if you already had tension in the pelvic floor for whatever reason, and then all of a sudden we have that big squeeze that can increase the tension in the pelvic floor um, going forward as well. So we have pain again, all the same things we talked about, urge again from that tension and biomechanical changes. So if you underwent, I don't know, a hip fracture, and you're trying to recover, but now you're walking differently, then you're going to impact the pelvic floor and potentially impact how you're using it or not relaxing it, which can then cause pain, which can then go into our other symptoms. So the biggest thing is that the pelvic floor remembers, and sometimes it remembers what we forget. And just like the shoulders and neck, we hold tension in the pelvic floor. It is a very, very common place to be holding tension. And it can be from a recent event, 
or recent positioning or an event from very, very long ago. So if any of that is happening, if you went through trauma, please, psychologist first, we need to make sure that um, the brain is doing well. And then what we do as physio is basically try to help downregulate the system and teach the pelvic floor how to relax. So that's a lot of kind of nervous system stuff. It can sometimes be manual therapy where we're physically massaging the muscles through there, the same way we would with a hip or a shoulder. Um, there's a lot of working on connection with that pelvic floor and then consciously using that connection to relax the pelvic floor. There's a lot that can be done. And something to really, really know, um, whether it's me or another pelvic floor physio or anything, you don't need to do an internal assessment if that is not what your body is ready for. So that's why if you ever see me, there's a very, very long intake form and I apologize, but it's so that we know the whole situation. And a lot of times you can at least get the general gist without an internal assessment until we can get there, right? So there's still so much that can be done and you are always in control. So if an internal assessment is going to create more of a stress response, that's the opposite of what we want. So it's really important that you know that there are things that you can do without putting yourself through a traumatic experience or something that could potentially be triggering. So it doesn't even need to involve touch. It can be anything that's within your power, but there are things out there. So if you were able to, to maybe make some sort of connection where between maybe why your hip has been hurting for a long time and you can't figure out why and you had a previous physical trauma or something like that, that connection could be made. And there is things that can be done in order to try and help. So I'm so sorry, 10 minutes over. Ooh. But basically, this was a heck of a lot of information. Um, if you can believe it, this is pared down from what I was hoping to say. But I just thought it was one of the most important connections that you can make is that there are a lot of little behind the scenes connections going on in the body that sometimes we don't really realize. So if this um, sparked any questions that weren't asked or anything like that, uh, please, please reach out. The clinic number is there, but that is my direct um, work email. So if you have any questions, though, that will go to me directly. And I always have no problem answering basic questions. Um, the other lectures are on our active sports therapy one YouTube page. So if I mentioned something and you had no idea what I was talking about, that might be a good place to start. But also that is where this lecture is going. So if you know someone that couldn't really watch the whole thing and want to get back to it, that's the link um, or that's the page that we want to go to. Now, I wanted to put a few resources on this one as well. If this was triggering, or you're just not in a good place psychologically, there are some resources there. Alberta Counseling Center is in the south of Calgary and they work with trauma. Um, Calgary Counseling Center is on a sliding scale for fees. So that's always a nice resource to have based on what you are able to pay because they want everyone to get some sort of counseling. Um, Can't we just get a long counseling, which is a hilarious name, is more of a relationship, but also deals with trauma, um, especially within relationships. And then lastly, Wellness Together Canada has free phone counseling. So if anyone's not doing well, please reach out. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Ellen, that was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> We're all still here because the content was oh. um, fantastic. I'm glad. Um, I had uh, one comment and I think it just summarizes it for me. Um, it was a thank you. I gained long needed insights. Um, I. I can certainly agree with that. I'm so glad. That's that's why we do this, right? It's just to try and get that information out there. Yeah, there's so much to unpack with um, all the different, uh, yes, everything in there. So yes, do not feel bad about going over for 10 minutes. I'm pretty sure <laughs> everyone yeah. in the group would agree. <laughs> um, does anyone have any further questions um, that they'd like to either type in or raise their hand and ask? Um, something that came up for me mm -hmm. that I'm quite curious about, and it was a comment of a friend that was off the cuff post um, miscarriage. And she mm -hmm. had said, oh, I wish there was, and in a delightful way, she said, I wish there was more research on what physically happens to the body after. 
as well as the emotional part. Um, is, is a physiotherapist the, the direction that you would want to go for that? Is there, or is there emerging research saying, yes, there's some physical things that happen, even if it's an early loss? Yeah, absolutely. Your body starts to adapt to the new life um, almost immediately. So there is um, actually, what are they called? There's a lovely organization in the States called BirthFit, actually, and they have a program for people who experience loss. And I love that because it goes through all of, not the exact same, but very similar um, kind of movements and connections with the body that they do in their postnatal programs. And I love that because that's, it is, your body starts changing right away. And so yes, a physio can help you go through that, but that's also a really nice um, kind of resource or connection. They're called birth fit. And sometimes I'll even reference them as well. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Cause a lot of people just think of postnatal as after birth of healthy baby, but there's so many other things that happen. Um, yes, definitely look forward to, um, doing some research on that. Um, it doesn't look like anyone, just a few thank yous. Um, doesn't look like anyone has any further questions. Um, there is, I do want to, um, kind of loop back to the active sports therapy YouTube page. It's something that we are, um, learning as we go. And, uh, yes, we are uploading all of these, um, lectures onto that. Um, and it's active sports therapy one, I I'm going to send a link to that, um, with the thank you note, um, like we do after every lecture. Um, so you won't have to go, what was the name of it? It'll be on that. Um, email that I send through and I'm um, just making sure I didn't miss anything. <laughs> um, so yes, don't forget to call into the clinic or you can always book online um, for a, an assessment with Ellen. Um, actually, I think I made this mistake last time. You can correct me here, Ellen. You have to call the clinic um, to get your personal pelvic floor assessment if you're looking at that kind of treatment. Is that yes. correct? You can't book that online. No, sadly. And that's just because we can only do pelvic treatments when massage rooms are available. So they're very specific within my normal day. Okay, perfect. Um, the phone number um, Ellen has listed down, it will come in emails. Um, and I just want to say one more huge thank you to Ellen for all your information. And for anyone that um, actually everyone stayed on till the end, thank you so much. Um, keep your eye out for the upcoming newsletters um, with more lectures. I think we have two more coming. I meant to actually uh, look for the topic of the next lecture, but I did not. Um, do you I know there's one on the bowels coming up. I don't remember if that's the next one or the one after and their relationship with the pelvic floor. I think that's okay. the next one. Okay, perfect. So um, we will have that posted on our newsletter so that you can sign up every month. I have a different sign up just to maintain, um, some privacy on the, on the links. So if you're wondering to, if you're wondering where the links are, look in the newsletter on the first Friday of every month. Um, I think that's all. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you everyone who joins. And thank you everyone. I, you so I love doing these. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.